Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the advertising manager of, for HGA and I get to be your host today. We want to thank everybody for being here today and we also want to thank our sponsor, Carla Thillman. And she's doing this in memory of a very good friend of hers, Elizabeth Howard. Look at that face. Wouldn't she just be somebody so much fun to do things with? So thank you, Carla, for memory, for um, honoring her and by doing it with textiles and tea. We do appreciate it. As always, please take your questions and put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. Uh, it's just really hard for me to see them in the chat and I don't want to miss anything. Love the comments though. Keep those coming. Those are great. Um, today we have Jenny Hockey. Um, Jenny Hockey, you may know from Hopewell Weaving. She's a weaver, a teacher, and an owner of Hopewell Weaving. She finds weaving to be endlessly fascinating and a wonderful creative outlet. Although weaving has been a longtime interest, teaching is Jenny's passion. She teaches at her home in central Illinois, online, and at various schools and conferences. She loves teaching weavers of all level, and she especially loves teaching beginners who bring enthusiasm and excitement to her classes. Recently, Jenny started a new weaving program for people with development disabilities called the Picket Fence Weavers. And we're gonna talk about that some later in the program. This talented group of fiber artists weaves rugs, tote bags, and other items to sell. Um, she says, we believe in the dignity of work and the beauty of art and the satisfaction of producing beautiful cloth by hand. Hey, Jenny. Welcome. Hi, Kathy. It's so good to have you here. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So what is your favorite tea? Well, I've thought about that. I, the one I grew up with, I guess, Constant con Comment, which is has orange and spice flavors to it. And I've uh, drank it all my life. Oh, it sounds delicious. Constant, what is it? Constant Comment. Oh, I'm going to have to look for that one. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell us, how did you get started in fiber? Well, um, I was uh, in teacher training at Illinois State University. And back then in the late 70s, um, many of the art departments had weaving as part of their art department. And they had looms there and et cetera. And there's a fairly uh, well-known weaver, I believe her name was Naomi Towner um, there. Some of you might uh, remember her name. Um, and so I, when I took my art class that I was required to uh, take, I was able to choose weaving because I had always sewn and done other fiber arts and loved that. And then after that, um, got married and then moved to Peoria and found the Hand Weavers Guild of Peoria. And that's been just uh, an amazing uh, constant in my life. And they've brought in speakers from all over. We've had the big name people um, for a long time. That's, now is that in normal? Illinois? That's in Normal, Illinois. Okay. And Normal was teaching schools. That's what mm -hmm. the word normal came from. Yeah. All right. Um, you, you studied education in college, like you said. And I was just curious, um, did you use a lot of that when you started teaching weaving or you went into the fiber arts? I would imagine that would be a great segue into it. Oh, for sure. And I've always taught uh, different learners. And so I started out actually in special education um, and uh, ended my career uh, teaching kids that spoke uh, another language than English. And so I've always tutored and, and tried to, you know, had to figure out how does someone learn and how can I best present information to them and break it down for them. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's, uh, I just feel like I'm an educator first and a weaver after that. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, that's great. I bet you learned a lot of nonverbal communication. <laughs> I mean, if you're not on the same language, you know. Exactly. And and also that, you know, people have different learning styles and that they learn best um, in different ways. And so you have to kind of watch them and think about what is it that, uh, you know, how are they picking this up? And adult learners the same. And a lot of adult learners come with baggage, you know, they come with fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so I always try at the beginning of a class to make people feel comfortable and relaxed, acknowledging that, you know, letting them know what we're going to do and that we're going to have a good time and et cetera. And I used to feel bad because it's like these people are spending money to do something fun. And I just wished I could have taken all the scared, 
fear, all of that away. It's like, let's just have fun, you know, yeah. don't be afraid. It'll be great, you know, and they usually get there. But I know what you mean about yeah. How, that, how that's scary at first. Well, we know what's coming, but they don't. In true, a class. true. And I've had several tell me that they were criticized by, a, you know, another teacher and they didn't want to go back. And, oh, what a terrible feeling that it could be. So. And then art class. Oh, my gosh. Everybody yeah. has horror stories from art classes. Yeah. You're not being good <laughs> enough. You're not an artist. You're using the wrong color. Yeah. yeah. Well, good for you. You're changing the world one student yeah. at a time. <laughs> Thank you. One student at a time, yes. <laughs> Well, one thing I love about your work is your color. And we've got an image coming up here, which is a great example of the vivid colors that you use. This is just gorgeous. I love this. Now, were you one of those kids that used like every color in the crayon box when you were little? Actually, no. And when I started weaving, I was very conservative. Really? So I was one of those weavers that had white and a color because the white one goes with everything, right? And then maybe I moved on to black and a color, but I've had the advantage of um, having a couple of people, you know, train me a little bit about color and I don't retain a lot of it. But one thing I learned was if you could have some sort of red, blue and yellow in your work, that those colors do well, you know, they bring a lot of drama to what you're doing and interest instead of just limiting yourself. And also, um, you know, the brightness, and you can see that here, mm -hmm. you know, that brightness versus non, and then color values. So sometimes I'll even take a picture of my work and make sure that I get contrast. And in this particular bag, I was going for contrast. So when I was doing those bands, I was looking for two or three colors that would contrast enough um, from each other that would uh, draw your eye and, and easily seen. So um, I know people are going to ask, so I'm going to go ahead and ask now, What what is this technique that you've done here? What's the so, pattern? Well, so that is crook bra. Okay. And um, when I do croak bog, I sit down with a little piece of graph paper and I draw out what I want. And I've used books, obviously, for inspiration and taking a look at things. But then I draw out um, each pattern and uh, put it up and uh, go from there. And I'll talk about croak bog in a little while, but um, it's a pretty simple thing to do. One thing that amuses me about this, I don't know if you can see maybe the second uh, group of objects that's kind of greenish. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I thought, oh, lovely pattern. And then when I was done, it kind of looks like skulls. It does. Especially upside down ones, yeah. <laughs> so, sometimes you got to be a little careful with what you design too. We were talking about that when we were looking at it earlier in the week. It was like, and then what's so cool is because right below it, it kind of looks like a cross. It's like... <laughs> This could be a whole theme of, you know, good versus evil and life versus death. <laughs> I really wasn't trying for a message, but I guess. Oh, I come did. on, Jenny. Just say you were. <laughs> um, now, looking at this next work, um, th this is a, another example of color that I, I really like. So I'm going to ask you one of those esoterical kind of questions. What is your color? If you were a color, what would it be and why? I think blue. You okay. know, you walk into the yarn store and you look around and it's the blues that draw me over to them. And often like jewel tone kinds of blues uh -huh. or blues that uh, blue and uh, mauve and uh, aqua and things like that, that all go together. But blue's usually the end of that. This particular picture was a um, just a variegated yarn, and I was lucky that just the color in that was amazing. Um, and that's a monk's belt pattern there. So that was variegated? Simple. Yeah, yeah. Did you have to lay the yarn out so it no. did this? No. Really? It just is what it is. Yeah, it looks like I did, but I'm not that. <laughs> I wasn't that talented for that. Jenny, so. you don't know how this works. You just say, oh, I did that. <laughs> This no, is gorgeous. Um, this is a bigger piece, and I encourage you all to part of a bigger piece. Um, it's on your website, right? I honestly don't know. To I tell think you it is. So I encourage that? people okay. if you want to see the rest of it that okay. that you do that. That's that's um, uh, it's a great piece. But I wanted to really focus in on what the color is in uh, that you use. Um, that one is really pretty. Yeah, you use a lot of. Um, weft faced weaving you teach a lot of that you use a lot of that um so 
And we've got some pieces coming up here that I want to look at because one is bound weave and the other one is the crook brog. Um, mm-hmm. And we can see them here. And if when you start talking, if you'll tell us which is which, that would be great. Um, so what is the main difference between these two weaves? That's one question. And then the second question is what what draws you to weft face? Okay. Well, technically, they're actually both bound weave. Okay. So croak brogged is a bound weave and croak right. is on the left and um, bound weave uh, figure to bound weave is on the right. And they're both a either a one, two or a one, three, 12 pattern. So um, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two is the threading on the croak brog. And then one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, three, two, one is on the bound weave. And what happens with that by having that extra shaft on the bound weave, it's a four shaft weave versus the three shaft for croak brog, you can get um, more precise looking objects. So back to the skulls, um, you know, I wasn't trying for a skull, but when I did those patterns, you can see that they're pretty simple and they are really, um, on, you only have a design of the three columns. So for instance, the cross there, you got the mm-hmm. center of it and each side, and then you have the negative space on either side of it to set it off. On my flowers on the right, the bound weave, that um, I'm able to have one more row on either side of the center, and that lets me do more complex um, patterns. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, I don't um, want, you know, it's not a workshop and I encourage <laughs> people to, to go take workshops if you're really interested in it. But so what is it about weft weave? You know, and when I say weft weave, for those who don't know, I'm pretty sure I'll let you answer this, is it's where the weft is more visible than the warp, right? Right. In okay. fact, the warp on these is entirely covered up, except maybe at the end where the fringe sticks out okay. where you've cut it. Um, and on both of these pieces, like the bag, those fringe were uh, covered because that's a line bag. Uh-huh. Um, so on these, I get a piece of graph paper and um, graph them out. And what I love about that is that what I put on the graph paper, I can see as I weave. Because what's happening oh. with the weave is you lift all the threads except one each time. So you're only covering all the ones from the first shaft. Mm-hmm. Then you're covering the twos from the second shaft and et cetera. Um, by doing that, you are thinking about the same as filling in that piece of graph paper, filling in those little dots. And so it's very similar um, from your graph paper to the bound weave um, and very fulfilling. So it's a very slow weave because every um, line of that has four um, picks. You're going across four times to fill up all of the um, the threads. Um, and uh, it's also um, the set on that is very open. And so you're beating down all those threads. I use wool usually when I do this. And so it's quite thick fabric too. Um, but it is fascinating to watch it kind of appear in front of you because as you weave and I would weave from the bottom up so I'd so I'd have a right side up flower um you could do it the other way but I like to do it that way um and then you can it's keeps your interest even though you're going back and forth a lot because mm-hmm. you can see the pattern happening in front of you you can yeah, also design pretty easily as you go along I'm sorry no no sorry I don't mean to interrupt but this is much more pictorial than some weavings right Oh, for sure. Yeah. And um, so the book that and the teacher that I had, and it was, uh, I think, 1984, Clotilde Barra, who wrote the book on bound weave that uh, some of us are lucky enough to have. Um, she came to Peoria and I was a, almost a brand new weaver and she was amazing and very frightening because <laughs> she was just putting this stuff up on the board and you know, uh, saying, do this, do that, do that. And I was so intimidated, but I learned so much from her. It just stretched me so much. And in her book, she also has, I believe it's six shaft um, figurative bound weave. So that you could have even more complex, you know, think of a a farmer with his face, you know, and have a little bit more to deal with as far as having a look for certain things that you can get even more uh, complex figures. Croak brag, back to that, is just little squares, little objects. Sometimes you can make them look a little circular, but that's about all you get. 
So it's on band weave, right? You know, I don't have that in front of me, but um, it's Clotilde, C-L-O-T-I-L-D-E, and Barrett is B-A-R-R-E-T-T. It is not in print anymore, but lots of guilds oh. have it in their collections. And so that's probably a good way if you belong to a guild to check and see if they have it. But but I want to make sure it's on Bound Weave. That's the name of it, right? It. I don't have the book in front of oh, me. Okay, I'm sorry. But the, I'm sorry. It does say Bound Weave on the front. It, it might say on Bound. I, I don't know. <laughs> I should have asked you this earlier. Yes, I? yes. Sorry, I can uh, I can let you know later. Well, speaking of books, were there other books that you um that you found? Unbound Weave? That you used that yeah. was kind of like your Bible. The the Crokebrag books. And uh, uh -huh. again, I'm sorry I don't have that author in front of me, but there's two really good modern Crokebrog books. Uh -huh. One is the explanation of Crokebrog and the other is patterns. And the pattern book I loved because um, she uh, groups her patterns into um, objects or uh, genres like a fair isle weaving kind of patterns. Okay. So then she made Crokebrog patterns out of those. And so she has a whole bunch of different um, someone put up in our comments, the book is bound by Clotilde Barrett. Thank you. And it's $409. And it's $409. <laughs> like she said, go check out your guilds and see if they have a library. <laughs> there you go. Mine is not for sale, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but the Crokebrog book is, uh, very, very, uh, easy to follow and easy to design from. So I could go in there, get inspired by what the kinds of patterns that she had in the blocks. Uh, Debbie Grinlaw is the author of that book. And, um, a thank you again to the chat. Um, and was able to use that. There are not a lot of books on bound weave and Crokebrog. You can find a little bit on the internet also. Mm -hmm. um, some people have made, uh, some videos and things out of that, but, uh, it is, it's difficult to find, but absolutely not difficult to do once you know the you know the design way and how to interpret that into your um into your weaving it's uh it, beginners to advanced people can do that well i don't maybe it's just i've become more aware of it but it seems like it's really had a resurgence lately i've seen it taught more often and you know i've seen it in more places Are, do you see I, that too i think facebook has helped too because people will put things up and share and uh, yeah, I think that has, has been a real help. Yeah, I got suckered in because I saw somebody do a sheep and it was like, I want a sheep. Who doesn't want sheep when they weave, right? So that's how I, I got suckered in. I saw a croak broad with sheep. That's At I'm one doing. of my classes, we were trying to figure out how to do a llama. So, and what we discovered Ooh. is you take a sheep and you extend its neck there and you then go. you've got a llama. So. <laughs> Don't tell the sheep and llama, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> yes, a smarter person than I figured that out, but it was very good. Hmm? Uh, um, many of your works are utilitarian, if I may use that word. Um, we've got a picture of a baby bib and this beautiful bag. I love this bag. Um, so what is the attraction for you? Because it seems like you do more of the utilitarian and the functional than you do the wall art or whatever you want to call it. What's the attraction? I guess, uh, you know, uh, early on, my fiber art started with sewing. So you make something, you wear it, right? And so that's probably one of the reasons. Um, I consider myself, you know, that whole debate about art and uh, craft, you know, that's a big one. I consider myself a maker and and a problem solver. And so I I like that title better. If, if that's all I was going to get, I'd pick maker, I think. Um, I love working out how things um, can be. And for instance, the, that bag, it was a carpet bag. I wanted a Mary Poppins. I wanted a carpet bag I could travel with. And so first of all, okay, how do you do that top and get it to open and close just like that? Well, there's a actually a device you can order that uh, you can sew within your bag and, you know, on and on. And then I got to learn um, uh, purse making from a gal up in North Bay, Ontario, and she taught me all the inner parts of the purse. And so I just love uh, problem solving, figuring out how to do things. I'm also the person, if you order a set of shelves, I'll be there and put them together for you. So, <laughs> which such makes me- the yeah. teacher. You're there such you go. the teacher, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And, uh, and looms, you know, we all have to work on our looms once in a while. We're, they're moving and sometimes uh, getting off 
off kilter. And so, um, you know, that's another way that we can solve that. So um, I also, um, the art that I own and, um, has like personal connection to. So the art, if I buy a piece of art, it's either because I was traveling somewhere and I want that memory mm -hmm. or using a bag like that because I have something with me that I made and that, that that's my memory. Um, and I just love, you know, giving something to someone that they can enjoy, like the baby bib, that that's not only just, that's not hanging on the wall, that's hanging on your baby. And it's actually, you know, maybe making your life a little easier. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you are the owner of Hopewell Weaving. So would you tell us how you got to first explain what it is? I mean, I had to ask you to make sure, you know, is the school, is it an art, you know, a yarn store, whatever. Tell us what it is. And then give us some idea of how you decided to go into a business. Okay. Well, um, I, I was an educator um, and was looking at retirement and wanted to teach weaving, you know, to kind of morph into that. And so I thought, how you know, how does one do that? I wanted to get a trailer initially and get 10 looms and put, you know, them in the trailer and take them places because people didn't have looms and couldn't weave. So uh, that's morphed a little bit. But anyway, um, and also, if you have a business, I wanted to treat it seriously and keep track of the money and market my business and, you know, get in students and etc. So and I'm also a very curious person, like, how do you do that? How do you start a business? And what does that mean? And what kind of business? So I put all those things together. Um, we have a really good local uh, university, Bradley University here, and they have a school of business. And there's a gentleman that's there that will meet with you and help you set up, you know, your business number and just the basics. And so I went with that. Um, and it's it's been great. And it gives me something to talk to people about to uh, promote my students and bring them in and etc. Got to learn how to make a website and how to send out emails and all that good stuff. So sometimes it's a chore, but mostly it's very enjoyable. And I really enjoy um, having that identity also. You're one of those special people that doesn't look as a problem. Like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? But you look at it as, oh, good. <laughs> Let's figure this out. Sometimes. I'm going to learn something new. Yeah, I love that. I, I wish well, I was more you. like that. That's <laughs> that's great. So you're the you're a artist. You're a teacher. You're a businesswoman. So how would you define your success for you? Would it be one of those? If it's successful, then you consider life a success. A combination of those three. What do you think? Well, when I feel best and most settled is when I have a balance in my life, you know, family's mm -hmm. in there too. Um, and so that I have enough to do, but I have time <laughs> off, right? I have <laughs> lots of students, but they go away and I have a little time for my own weaving and, you know, all those kinds of things. And I think balance is, you know, hard for women, um, you know, we end up doing more than we should a lot of times yeah. and regretting that. And I also find I enjoy one task more if it's challenged by the other tasks. So if I'm busy, I enjoy my quiet time. If I have a lot of quiet time, I enjoy oh. being busy. So, yeah, that's how I, I manage it. And it's always, you know, it's always a struggle. You always have to figure it out. So It is. It's tough. Yeah. I like that balance of if I, one makes me appreciate the other. That, I like that. I have to think about that one. That's good. Um, over the years of your weaving career, um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes. So what are some of the major changes that you have seen? And how do you think you have accommodated those changes for yourself? Well, when I thought about that question, um, I think the two biggest ones I've seen are rigid head of looms and online teaching. So yeah. I'll explain those two. But I remember when rigid head of looms first came in and they were calling them knitting looms, I think, at the yarn store, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm not sure why anybody would want to do that, you know, because I've got my four chef looms. I've been <laughs> doing this for years. It's I can do patterns and da, da, da. And then like that exploded. And for one thing, it was kind of an entryway into what I do, but there's plenty of people that 
weave on rigid heta looms and just do amazing work on them. Um, and there's certainly, I remember the first time I saw the video on how to warp a rigid head loom. It was the Ashford one, I think. And it was like 20 minutes. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that is amazing. Because I'm a fast warper, but I don't warp a loom in 20 minutes. Not, uh-uh. So that is one thing. And then, you know, along with that, like pin looms and different things that people are um, using for looms uh, have been great. And then the other, with when the pandemic hit, um, I luckily had um, developed an online class that I was kind of playing with. And I'd had some friends take it from me for free just to see, you know, like I was kind of panicked about it. Um, and then when it started, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to offer this for free. And so during the pandemic, I probably ran it, oh, I bet you a dozen times. And what it was, was there were for two hours for five times. So about every other day, we'd meet for two hours and I'd tell them the next step. Okay, here's how you plan. Next one. Here's how you wind the warp. Next one, you know, on and on. And then by the fifth one, they should be warped and ready to weave. And so that was so much fun. And I started to build my audience. You know, people were grateful to have a, a free class. I figure if they're sitting at home and they've got a loom, that's a great time for them to try that out. And that worked well. And then I got my courage up to start to develop some of the other classes that I taught um, on an online basis. And that has just opened up the world, literally the world to me. Um, I teach most of my students in the United States, but almost always have time zones from, you know, East Coast to West Coast. Mm -hmm. And then I have had students, I had people from um, Australia say, hey, Jenny, we can't take a Saturday morning class because that's like 3 a.m. to us, please. So um, I figured out how to do a time zone and teach a class in Australia. I've had people from Shetland and Scotland and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been a real joy. So I would say those two things in my world anyways, the rigid heddle and the online teaching have really changed things. And I think for a lot of us that uh, teach, you know, and have been able to do online, that has really changed a lot of people's careers even. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So if if you had your preference, would you stay at home and teach or go travel and teach? Oh, that's a good question. I think I'd stay at home, mm -hmm. but I I enjoy traveling to teach. Um, it's a, It's a great opportunity, again, to see people in person. At home, I live out in the woods. And not everybody wants to come out here. So <laughs> it's, and we don't have the best um, hotels around in my area. So you have to kind of go uh, 30 minutes from me to get to a kind of a good hotel. Um, so I struggle with that a little bit. One of the most fun things I've been doing is teaching a retreat in a little town called Bishop Hill, Illinois. Um, I've done that for the last six years. And that's been a joy because we all stay at the inn and have meals together and, you know, just have a nice weekend. So that's been fun. Oh, I love that kind of camaraderie. That's yeah. nice. That's nice. Um, I have to say that I was, I was a, uh, I guess a weaving snob because same thing. I was looking at Richard Hill and going, why would you do this? Just get you a loom. And then I have to say, I have to give a shout out to a, a, a guildmate of mine, um, Elise teaches these classes and the things she does on a rigid heddle, it opened my eyes. It was like, it's not just, you know, crappy little dish cloths that fall apart when you take them off. She did beautiful, beautiful stuff. So it really has revolutionized it. It really isn't, okay, once you learn how to weave, you're going to move on to something bigger and better. Uh -huh. They're doing great things. Great, great things. Yeah, I agree. And the books that have been written and they're the Little Looms magazine. And oh, yeah, and lots of great resources now yeah. that are very inspiring. Um, tell us about uh, the Picket Fence Weavers. We mentioned it um, in your bio, but tell us some more about that, if you would, please. Well, um, <laughs> that's Casey. Hi, Casey. Um, <laughs> so um I, I told you that I started in special education and it's, it's been um, a very interesting um, journey because when I uh, graduated from college, you know, you have your dreams. I want to do this. And I wanted to have a place where people could come and make things. And here I am at the end of my career and my, my senior years um, doing 
basically what I had dreamed of back then. Um, and so uh, Picket Fence Foundation is uh, run by a family in the little town near me in Chillicothe, Illinois. And uh, they um, they have a son who has a disability um, and they had a dream to have uh, a farm that people could come to and work and camp out on. And uh, all the time he was going through school and I worked in that school district that he went to, um, they were dreaming about this. But then the garden center came available in this little town of Chillicothe, a picket fence garden center. And they thought, oh, what a perfect match to the farm that we buy this, we employ people with disabilities, have them work here. Well, over the years, we had talked a little bit about weaving. They knew I was a weaver and that uh, weaving might be something that folks could do for work also. So once they got uh, the uh, gardening center, uh, we talked and uh, they actually own the building next to the garden center also and the little storefronts, a little strip mall kind of place and had an empty one. And they allow us to use that empty storefront. And I have probably eight or 10 looms in there. We have four big rug looms. Casey's on a little Harrisville there. She makes uh, uh, mug rugs. Um, so what we do is we weave products for the picket fence store, the gardening center store. And so we have our own booth there. They have lots of entrepreneurs with people with disabilities that make things. In fact, Casey has her own business. She makes candles. And uh, so she's got her own booth, but she also comes and weaves for us. And, and uh, Casey has autism and she is very, a very precise person. So her edges are amazing. Oh. She can weave up something. She just sits down and gets it going. And it's just fun to watch her. And she's been weaving for about two years now. She's getting really good at it. I've got another weaver that does rugs and we do rag rugs. He can weave a rug, rag rug in an hour. And I am not exaggerating. And I, he just knocks them out. And so I hand it to him. He knows the routine. He does his header. He weaves his rag rug, does the header on the other side. And then he takes his break because he's earned it. So, but I have six weavers um, right now and uh, we meet on a couple afternoons a week and they earn money for doing their work. They uh, sell their things at the store and then we get the money back from the store and that goes home with them. So it's been a great uh, vocational option and uh, just and just a great group of people. Um, they're lovely people and caring about each other, and we just have a good time. Do you ever, and I know you teach weaving, but do you ever teach how to, to do what you're doing with the picket fence? I got people saying, oh, I want to do that. That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm serious. Is that something yeah. that... They're, they're welcome to get a hold of me, and I'd love to talk to them. Um, actually, my kind of mentor was Ability Weavers up in um, Michigan. And so if you, um, they're on Facebook too, and uh, they actually do it as a retail business um, instead of a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And they pay their their weavers um, minimum, more than minimum wage, and they have their own building and et cetera. And so uh, they have been uh, very generous with, you know, when I was trying to figure this out, um, how, how can we do this? How can we support the weavers? How do you get people started? Um, everybody's got their own, you know, abilities and uh, things that they struggle with. And they really helped me uh, figure that out. And so early on, before we really got going, my husband and I drove up there. We stayed the, the night um, in the little town where Ability Weavers is um, and we're able to go and visit them and see what they did. So uh, they are they're outstanding. But yes, I'd love to to visit with anyone. Um, and they're always welcome. If they're in Illinois, come visit us. Um, I had a friend of mine, she works at the local um, uh, secondhand store, and she kind of keeps an eye out for us. So she got all this fabric in that that uh, she couldn't use for other things that she does. And so she said, Jenny, you want this fabric? I said, sure. So she brings this huge bag of fabric to me. And then she said, oh, well, I could sit and do some work for you. I said, sure. And so we always have rugs to knot or, you know, fabric to cut or whatever. Um, and so the volunteers really enjoy being there too. And um, if you come and visit me, you might get put to work too. <laughs> So what is the, if there is one, a guideline of who, who comes in and, and is part of this? 
Um, do they have to be recommended? They can just, somebody can just show up and say, I'd like to do this. How do you, you know, decide? Usually they come through the picket fence because the picket fence, um, uh, employs people with disabilities like to work in this oh oh i see i see okay and um they'll mention us especially if someone mentions that they like art or something like that um the other is that we're we're only uh working two afternoons a week and sometimes people are looking for different kinds of hours and things like that but uh we have lots of people with um developmental disabilities but that doesn't preclude other people working there and anyone i disability or not disability come and you know if you want to weave with us then we'll figure it out another thing i've been doing to raise money for picket fence is on saturday mornings i have community classes so just uh people from the community and lots of times i get a group of ladies that are friends and they just want to come over and so i uh, fill my four uh, rug weaves with them and have them pay a fee and then all that money goes to help pay for our heat and etc so um, but that's been really fun. We've done three of them so far. And so far, I just fill them up really fast. Um, and it's a really neat interaction because a lot of people have never touched a loom before or maybe have just seen one. Mm -hmm. And they're amazed that they can weave a rug in a morning. So they come in at nine. I give them some instruction. You know, here's how the loom works. And here's what we do. And set them to work. And they walk out, you know, with their uh, usually a denim rug. So it's been a joy. You're always thinking, aren't you? I am. Always thinking about what can you do next. That's great. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so when are you going to write your book? No book. Oh. Well, I guess <laughs> what I you. should be asking I you. admire people that write the books, <laughs> and I wish that I could, but I, it is just not my thing. And you have to kind of sometimes just settle for what you're good at, you know? Yep, you got to go with what you're good at, right. Um, so what is next for you? Next for me, um, right now, um, I, you know, I kind of go off on these tangents and um, I have found uh, some manuscripts by John Landis, um, who was a, a weaver and um, I think a professional weaver in the revolutionary times. And Mary Meigs Atwater wrote um, up his patterns. She took his patterns and um, made drafts of them. Mm -hmm. And it's on, you know, that Arizona website that mm -hmm. you can get the free materials. Mm -hmm. So his stuff is on there. And when I, I ended up uh, getting like a hard copy of those books and well, I was fascinated that you could take this, this gridded drawing of a, let's say an overshot pattern, mm -hmm. but it could also be done in summer and winter and it could be done in, in double weave. I thought, I would love to see that. So that's what I'm working on. I have a picked four of them and uh, I don't have a 16 shaft loom. So I uh, was uh, Leslie uh, Fesserman from the Yadkin Valley Fib Fiber Center, who you've interviewed before. She let me come and use her 16 shaft loom for a couple of days. Oh, nice. Yes. And then the others, I, you know, I have an eight shaft loom. I can do summer and winter and I have a four that I can do overshot. And so I'm in the middle of that project right now. And it's just my own curiosity. I just want to see what that is. And I don't know. So, um, and then just travel. I love to do art travel. I've gone a couple of times to Italy um, and I was um, able to weave in Florence um, on the big jacquard looms at the Liceo. Some of you have been there and uh, that was amazing with the tour studio. It's a uh, travel group and, and they're wonderful. And I just came back from Venice in October, uh, spending a week there on textiles. So travel needs to be in my future. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, we know the tour studio. They, uh, they're they in our magazine. If you want more information about the tour, tour studio, check it out. They're in the um, shuttle spin on the iPod. That sounds amazing to go and weave yeah. there. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, we have some questions. Shall we take them? Sure. Let's see what people are asking. Um, I think we've clarified the books about On Bound Weave and everybody. <laughs> thank you all so much in yes. the chat. <laughs> This is great. I can't really down. do that. <laughs> and um, they, they've they listed several of the books, actually, and other people. Oh, this is great. I haven't seen them all. They're all talking about all the different people um, that you can check out and, and teach. So that's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Karen LeBlanc wants to know, do you prefer production weaving or one-of-a-kind weaving? Oh, absolutely one of a kind. I cannot hardly ever do the same thing twice. 
<laughs> so I put a warp on and then I just, you know, alter it. I, I'm thinking while I'm leaving one, well, how can I do this differently than the second one? So, yeah. We are kindred spirits in that, you and I. Um, <laughs> do you exhibit your work? And if so, where? I, I hardly ever exhibit my work. I sell once in a while and it has more to do with, um, I just make so much that I need to give it, do something with it. And I really, I've always been hesitant, yeah, I've been hesitant about like giving my daughter a scarf and thinking that she would feel like she had to wear it and maybe didn't like it. So I would much rather sell something and have somebody want that. So that's my philosophy. That's, that's a good point. That's very true. Um, will you be doing, oh, will you be doing another retreat this year or next? And will the link be posted on your website? Well, that is a good question. Um, the inn is up for sale. Oh no. And they have said. And you're going to run out and buy it, aren't you? <laughs> oh Lord. No, <laughs> there's another thing I'm not going to do with my life. Um, but, uh, the, I'm kind of waiting a little while. I really think it's a neat business and somebody will buy it, but I hesitate to uh, have a registration when things are kind of up in the air. But it is the last weekend in October. And yes, it will be up on the website if and when. Okay. All right. There you go, Sean. So watch the website. Uh, <laughs> Dina Ross wants, when is your next, oh, next Bishop Hill retreat? Same thing. All right. Um now, here's Karen again. Karen always comes up with the bestest questions. Thank you, Karen. I love the concept of Hopewell Weaving, and I'd love to hear more about how you set that up and keep it running in all your spare time. Hmm. You well, get a lot done. <laughs> that's a really good question because I'm teaching a class at Convergence called The Art and Craft of Weaving Teaching. So... Um, if, if you're going to Convergence, that class is going to be available. And I'm going to talk about how I set up the business and also, you know, the website and the different things, just kind of the different elements that go together with that. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, so, um, yeah. So if, uh, if possible, but otherwise, you know, get a hold of me. I'm happy to share with what I know and I don't mind that at all. Now, is that a, I don't remember, is that a one day workshop? That, that one hour? is a hour and a half. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I, I did a bad job saying the name of it. It's the art and craft of teaching weaving. And I'm go. also teaching a bound weave class. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, when's your bound weave class? That is on um, Sunday through, I'm sorry, Monday through Wednesday. It's a three-day class. There you go, folks. Right. Bound and weave. Figurative bound weave. By the bound weave pro. <laughs> and if you like the way she's, I would love to learn how to set up a um, a studio fun. like that and that i will be... show the llama too if you would Yay, <laughs> we the llama. The llama <laughs> i'm gonna have to sneak in to see it there you go. um sean said if i wanted a cushy thick wool rug could i do it with eight shaft crop rug yes rug. yes you could yep and it, now knowing that croak rug on the back side is different it'll look different because Remember, you got three shafts. One is showing on the top, but then the other two, there's a lot of more floats. So I think sometimes people solve that with um, putting some sort of lining or or material on the bottom, okay. or they just like the backside. You know, the backside is just different looking. It isn't necessarily bad looking. So just say. Terry Shoemaker was saying the tour studio, and that's right. And she said she found it. Way to go, Terry. She was yeah. looking for a tour studio. They're They're wonderful to deal with and they have wonderful tours so i'd All highly right. recommend them um she, uh april price wants to know are you going to do more workshops maybe at leslie's at the yakin valley i don't know um she and i have not talked she's been busy teaching she teaches a class that is a certificate class so right. we haven't talked but we know that we're having dinner at convergence so we'll we'll talk then all right you got people lining up to take your class already <laughs> that'd be awesome love to have you well, you've talked about some of the people that have been inspirations for you. Who else inspired you, um, especially to to go outside the box and do different things, like like the pick we the, the pick a fence or starting your own studio? Where did that inspiration come from? Oh goodness, that's a hard one. Um, I you know 
The teachers that I've had over the years, and like I mentioned, the Handweavers Guild of Peoria has brought in, you know, Anita Mayer Luber and um, uh, Sharon Alderman and all these different people that are amazing teachers and have added so much to um, to weaving and have written books. And uh, Jennifer Moore is another one. Um, also uh, at my house, beside my house, I have a cottage and it's guest quarters. And so the last couple of teachers we've had like Jennifer Moore, Robin Spady, they stay with me. It's Ooh, very nice. good because <laughs> they have their own little quarters right next to me and we ride to the workshop together. And so I get to visit with them and, and hear what they do and get inspired by them. So that that has really been a joy. Um, the other people that I weave with um, and work with, and sometimes, you know, the, especially the picket fence, I mean, the parents that uh, two of my biggest volunteers are parents that come along with their, their kid, you know, their adults, but, and they're right there with me, um, you know, uh, working on rugs, we do things together. And yet I get to go home and relax and gosh, I got to feed the dog, darn it. And they've got kids, you know, people to take care of that have more needs than I do. And, you know, that live with them and et cetera. And I just, they inspire me every day. I mm -hmm. can't uh, think how uh, joyous they are with their, with their folks and good with them, but still, you know, they give so much for their, of their lives for them. So, yeah. Um. Oh, somebody wanted to know if you're in Chillicothe, Ohio or Illinois. It's <laughs> Illinois, right? Yeah, it's Illinois. That's a good question, though, because often Chillicothe, I think Chillicothe, Ohio is a bigger town. So it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, faster that way. But it's. Really um, what do you think is the biggest thing that keeps people from wanting to, to jumping in there and learning to weave? Um, not having equipment is yeah. one of the biggest access ones. to equipment. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, I've been lucky that our. Um, our area, we have a civic center in Peoria, Peoria Civic Center. And um, once a year, we have an event called Ignite Peoria. And it is a free art um, event. And all these artists come in and I bring four looms in and people weave all day on my looms. We just bring them in and you know, I have to kick them off. And, but uh, they, they just love the weaving and they look forward to it every year. And it's more kids than adults, but certainly adults do that too. And my purpose for that, well, you know, to promote my business a little bit, but more that just people have woven, like they've sat at a loom and gotten to weave something. And uh, I, I finally figured out because they can't usually take something home. But what I've been doing with the kids is um, they weave a bookmark and then the next person weaves another bookmark and I don't cut them off as I go along. I have them fill out an envelope with their name and their home address. And then when I get back home, I cut them all up. I throw their bookmark um, in an on the envelope and stick a stamp on it and send it to them. And you know, kids don't get mail very much. The oh yeah, days right. So they actually get something in the mail, and that's been a real joy. And I the the second year I did it, I had parents say, "Oh yeah, they use that bookmark. They love that, you know, and they remembered that, and they want to come back." And then right across the aisle from me is the sewing guild, and they go over there and they make a mug rug or something. So it's just so wonderful that they can do fiber arts and have their hands in it. I'm also involved with the um, Peoria Art Guild and um, I'm on their board actually, but they have uh, really promoted the fiber arts and they have fiber arts classes. Um, they have sewing machines. We can teach um, different fiber arts. We've, we had a wonderful um, artist and I'm sorry, I don't, don't have her name either, but she uh, takes old fabric, you know, if you, or old wallpaper, you know, the ones with all the flowers on them. And then she'll paint out part of it and put a house in there or something. So it's kind of like frame the old wallpaper, framing the picture of the old house that's painted. And it's just, it was just amazing to see what she did. Yeah. So as, yeah, <laughs> there's more ideas than, yeah. You'd think they were all used up, but they're not. 
<laughs> so, and she had people coming in from, you know, Nashville and from, uh, you know, hundreds of miles away to come and buy her art. They just wanted to see what she had done. So if you look up the Puri Art Guild, um, they have information about her on their website. And she's uh, they've done an interview with her, too, on her process and how she does that. So she even did it to the point of letting some of the wallpaper show through. So, for instance, if I were standing um, and you could see my blouse, maybe you could see the wallpaper kind of mimicked onto my blouse by letting some of it, you know, show through. She's just, she's incredible. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, somebody wants to know, what is the typical size of your class? Oh, so um, at home, is it's usually pretty small. I, I can only take about eight at most, and I usually end up with two or three. And the nice part about it being here in the cottage mm -hmm. is if I have one person, I'll teach the class. I don't almost never cancel a class um, because um, it, I don't, you know, it's, I'm already paying the, the house payment. It's not, doesn't cost me anything except some time. Um, my, my online classes, I limit to eight. And if you think about the Brady Bunch look with the nine <laughs> figures, I want to be able to talk to my students. You know, I run, I, I don't do videos other than just little ones that show a technique, but I don't videotape myself. In fact, I tried to do that one time and I could literally couldn't talk. It was terrible. And you can hear I can talk, but uh, I just would choke up and I, you know, and I, you know, so, but uh, that way, if I can see everybody on a screen, then we can interact with each other. They can talk to each other. It's mm -hmm. been a really good experience that way. And uh, I think people leave feeling like they really were paid attention to, even though I'm not with them on an online class. Online classes are kind of weird because you teach. And then the first one I taught, I thought, okay, well, I'll just sit here. You go to your looms, you do that sample. And, and then I just sat there by myself for about two hours. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing that's like, yeah. one of the few ones I went on, she was like, okay, I'm going to be wandering around the house. If you need me, just say something, because I can hear you. <laughs> like, okay. I don't even do that. I say, text me or call me. Yeah. And then I, I can jump back on Zoom at any moment. And I there do. You go. But it is very strange. And I have them send pictures of their work as they go along. And then they can look at each other's. Oh, that's a great um, idea. Yeah, yeah that way. Yeah. But it is kind of a weird situation. But, you know, not everybody can get to a class. And uh, it's it's a nice way to to reach out to people. So it's worked out well, Somebody well. was asking about your the bag, the Mary Poppins bag, if I can call it that. Um, is there another construction or... Um, Another type of construction that you would like to try that you haven't tried yet? Um, well, um, I, if I can answer a different question. Okay, please do. <laughs> um, there are other kind of bags that I like to make. Um, I started out um, by taking a class from Catherine Brin, and she still teaches sewing up in North Bay, Ontario. She actually worked for Vogue, and wow. and her job with Vogue was, you know, when you get a magazine and it says, okay, here's how you construct this, and they show you all the steps. She was the person that did that kind of work. So she'd have the different pieces and her, you know, all her stitches are straight and everything. But she, just like me, she has a place in her home that you can go and take a class. And so I learned so much from her. But um, I, one of the purses that I discovered lately is a called a Japanese rice bag. And it's, it's a Komi burrow, I think is the, the way you pronounce it. And it is a, if you think of four sheets of paper, right? all, you know, like a lunch bag shape with a square bottom. And then um, I've taken old uh, pieces of my fabric. You know, you have pieces left from something or you did a sample or whatever. You piece them into that eight, eight and a half by 11, you know, error, uh -huh. eight by 10 sheet. And you do four of those and then you make a bag out of that. Um, and then just have a tie at the top. So, and oh, I, I line them, but yeah, and it's a great way to use scraps. Um, and, and then I embroider on them. I've also been doing Sashko, which is that oh. Japanese stitching. Um, and so I've been teaching that lately. <laughs> um, and so there's lots of ways to decorate them. And, and yet it's a simple kind of thing. If you're interested in that, um, uh, just, um, uh, or, uh, Google, um, 
Japanese rice bag. And there's several really good videos that just are real clear and show you how to do it. No, no, no. We're coming up. We're going to come up and you're going to teach us all how to do that. Okay. We'll be days, but yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, that one's really fun and it's simple. Um, it's simple to do. And, and uh, yeah, I like that oh, that'd one. That'd be great. I'd like, I'll have to look that up. Yeah. That would be fun to do. Japanese rice bag, right? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. Well, it's time to quit. I can't believe it. Thank you so much for being, I have learned so much from you today. Well, thank you so thank much. You. It's been and I hope you see all the hearts and the applauses floating up right now. <laughs> and I'm going to try to save your chat so you can see what everybody said. There we go. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, and I would encourage, you know, if people want to get a hold of me, feel free to do that. Um, there we go. I'm Jenny Hockey, Hopewellweaving.com. Go to our website. You're going to see all kinds of really cool things that she does. Um, and more images of some of her work and you can get a hold of her and, you know, tell her what class you want and, and she'll do it. I know she will, <laughs> whether she wants to or not, we're going to make her do that class. <laughs> we also want to thank our sponsor today. It's such a nice sponsorship today, Carla Thillman. Um, and she's doing this in memory of Elizabeth Howard. Elizabeth, I hope you're watching and I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, and thank you so much, Carla, for um, using uh, textiles and tea to honor your friend, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, if you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea or your business or your guild, um, please go online to wespendie.org. Um, go to the tab and find uh, Textiles and Tea, and you can go from there and be a sponsor. We would love to have you. You can talk about your upcoming event. Uh, talk about your good friend that you want to honor. Uh, or talk about your business or your guild. We'd love to hear about it. And this is a great way to do it. Thank you so much. Um, we've got Convergence and Small Expressions coming up. If you're not familiar with Small Expressions, it is a wonderful exhibit and it's um, it's of a smaller size. And again, I've, I've said this every time, but it's really important. And anybody who's ever entered anything understands this. It's not like you take something big and you just shrink it down. You really have to design it for 15 inches. And that challenge comes up with some beautiful, beautiful work. We're so excited. It's going to be at Convergence as always. Um, call for entries is open. Uh, the deadline is March 31st, so we're coming up on it soon. But if you have something you wanna enter, please do. It's exciting to have it at Convergence. So many people will see it. And then after that, it will travel. Uh, this is an exhibit that we send around the United States. And if you're interested in hosting it, please let us know. I know some of the regional conferences are asking to have the, um, the exhibit there while their conference is going on. Or if you have an event with your guild and you want the exhibit in your city, that would be wonderful. Contact us at weavespindie.org. And... We have other exhibits at conference too. We've got basketry, we've got mixed media, we've got wearable art and we have yardage. Um, and they're all gonna be at the convention center. I'll tell you, that's one of the nice things about Convergence is that the quality and the amount of beautiful work you're gonna get to see, you're gonna see it at Convergence. All these exhibits will be available and you can see them there. And just remember, you may want to sign up for Convergence and don't forget that, um, she will be there. She's going to teach bound weave. I may have to figure out how I can get in there and watch this. I would love to learn how to do bound weave. And as you can tell, she's a wonderful teacher. So we're excited to have her there. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are excited. Um, Careers in Textiles is in this week. It's going to be Friday. This Friday. I can't believe that. March 22nd. And again, if you aren't familiar with this program, this is an opportunity for um, you to learn more about if I want to be in fiber as, an, as a career, what are my options? And this is a great way to see this. Uh, we have everything from teachers to the industry leaders, from people who are hiring fiber people, and they're going to talk about um, your career in textiles and how that can happen. So please join us. Now, this is open to anyone, but it's really geared for people like students or someone in the uh, industry that wants to look for a job. So if you know someone who's getting a fiber art degree and you want to watch this and let them know what you've seen or tell them about it, that would be great. We're looking forward to it. If you're a student or you're an HGA member, it is free. If not, you can also join. 
for a fee. So thank you all. Check this out. It is this Friday. You can go online to weavespindie.org and sign up. Uh, it is a virtual. And as always, it will be uh, recorded for 90 days and you can watch it later if you can't watch it on Friday. It's a great program. Check it out. Thank you to everybody who has joined or donated. Um, that is a way that we keep programs going, whether it's careers in textiles, textiles and tea, uh, spinning and weaving week. You're joining and donating, especially the donating. That's what keeps our um, programs new, exciting, and fresh. And we love doing that for you guys. So thank you so much for, um, for your donations and joining HGA. If you haven't joined yet, please do. We spin die.org and you can join there. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, we're excited that um, if you want to watch any of these programs this week or next week and you haven't had a chance yet, remember they're online and you can watch them. You can either watch them on Facebook or you can watch them on YouTube. And I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel because you will get a notice when a new one has been uploaded. So thank you so much. Uh, next week, we have Meg Stump. She is the queen of those little square looms. What she can do on those is amazing. So we're going to have her on next week and we're excited to see her. Have a great week and happy tea.